happened is several months after I was in Italy, the pandemic happened and my experience changed. Nonetheless, the Black Amours became actually even more salient in my experience uh, in Italy, and I will explain why. And so I'm talking about tonight my takeaways, and this is very, this is very white paper presentation. I'm still thinking through a lot of things in Italy because I had to relearn a lot of cultural understandings um, wh while there at the same time, navigate this terrain with not speaking Italian because the day that the pandemic, we, we had to go in quarantine was the, my first day, supposed to be our first day of classes, uh, Italian classes, and it, it, did, it never reopened at least until I was there. So I had to navigate that. And I also had to navigate it as a uh, dark skinned person who, on first sight, a lot of Ital white Italians um, read me as a West African immigrant. And so that came with a lot of negotiation. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it, most times it was not good. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so this is, in, in, as in the last um, presentation, it is very, um, uh, what is that? Call and response or engaging. So if you have a question, please shoot it and let's talk. All right. Share the screen. If you see the craziness on my screen, excuse me. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, that was supposed to be, here we go. All right, so Moors to Mocha Rico. The reason why I titled this Moors to Mocha Rico is uh, coming into Italy, I had um, an understanding of Italy from the perspective of its relationship to the Moors uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, but when I went to Italy um, in terms of what blackness looked like and how it was presented, wasn't necessarily uh, what, I, what I thought. Um, so the two pictures in this um, presentation, the first one uh, is uh, of what they call a, a, a testa di moro, which is a Moorish head or head of a Moor. Uh, and then the um, picture underneath it is a sugar packet that is used uh, for, for coffee. So, um, and this resonate this resonates actually with me because uh, in my in my research, when I looked at how people of African descent navigated and negotiated their identities, I also did a very deep dive on how they were represented in American popular culture. So the bottom left image uh, is very much similar to the pop culture. Uh, of the caricatures that were often used in as advertisements in the United States for well over 100 years. Uh, and to date, the, uh, minstrel shows to date are still the most popular pop culture uh, in America. So what I wanted to do is in particular in this case, I wanted to talk about what does blackness look like in Italy right now, but look at it through the material popular culture uh, that I engaged in while I was most, mostly in Florence, Italy, which is where I pretty much resided. And for the last month uh, of me being in Italy, I traveled extensively throughout the whole country. So as I said again, um, I was in Italy for almost two years. And in that time <laughs> I experienced the pandemic but what I also experienced was what the George Floyd protest looked like outside of the United States. And what I had come to understand is, is Italy's issue with racism. And while there, I began, to un, I began to hear the concerns and issues of non-white people in particular about Italy's structural racism that exists. Italy is, I call it, the immigration system in Italy is a sanguine one, meaning um, if you cannot trace or track your bloodline in Italy, then it is very difficult for you to become a citizen. Thus, most... 
excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. Thus, most people uh, who are immigrants remain residents and they have to renew their uh, paperwork every year like I did. While I was in Italy leading up to it, I experienced what I called immigration in a Salvini world, which was very hostile uh, against black people. Um, often I was not properly serviced. Uh, people were rude uh, in, in some ways, but also I was an oddity because I've discovered that I lived in one of the uh, um, middle, upper middle class buildings in Florence. And my husband and I were the only black couple uh, that lived in, um, in the area. During the pandemic, what struck me was uh, the, as you can see, these pictures that you see, me smiling, this is right here uh, with my husband. This is our last date before quarantine. Uh, me with the um, with the camera taking the selfie, that is during the pandemic when uh, Florence, Italy became a ghost town. Uh, and then below that picture is, you know, what the lines were like, or standing in line uh, and waiting to get food. Uh, Conad is a, a popular store. Uh, I want to earmark in this in this time though, what what who I did see were what was called essential workers in the, in the United States. The domestics, the people who worked at bakeries, the the, not the mechanics, but the people who washed the cars, the panhandlers, which were all black and brown people. And so they became visible uh, in a city that, where they were mostly invisible uh, because Florence, Italy has, has roughly between 16 to 18 million tourists per year in a, in a city that holds roughly about has roughly a population of 200,000 uh, people. So when I began to um, look at uh, or and experience what it was like, and during this time, um, I was called nigger, which I found out is called netto. And the reason why I discovered that was because I was walking home with a colleague who is of Eritrean and Italian descent. And we were talking and a car of uh, white, young white men passed by and they were screaming out the name and my colleague responded. And as a black person who's been in this situation before, because that's what happened to me when I was in Germany, I kind of figured it out and I asked her afterwards and she told me and she was so rattled because it was the first time that she had ever been um, called that. Well, I was called that several more times while I was in um, Italy um, during the pan during the pandemic, so I got to know that word. Unfortunately, a little bit more in um, sorry. Unfortunately, a little bit more intimately. A lot of the the concerns uh, about being black and racism right now in Italy is more of a contemporary one. But what I discovered is is that there was sort of kind of like um, and well, when let me say this. Let me kind of back up. And talking about race in Italy, there is a law that for actually makes it illegal for you to talk about race in a, in a workplace, in a public place. So what a lot of white Italians would do in order to get around that, they would enact this law to not talk about race. Or in some cases, I was called racist when I was talking about, let's talk about race. So it was this very interesting dynamic um, going on, as well as um, I was told, oh, Italy is not racism. Take that American racism back to the United States. We're not racist here. Um, when clearly the immigration laws were coded so that black and brown people uh, and Eastern Europeans could not, so in Italy, depending on your citizenship is how you got employed. So if you were a resident, you could only have certain jobs. If you were undocumented, you could not have any jobs. And often you were exploited in the agricultural fields or a sex worker uh, in various type of um, demeaning positions like that. So I wanted to kind of, things that I began to discover, and this is all in a, in a research in terms of what uh, we would call the literature review. So I thought it was really interesting as I began to travel and got out of quarantine, um, when 
sorry, before I before I got into quarantine and I was studying um, Italy, this picture to the right, those beads hanging down, I always knew them as African glass beads or trade beads. What I discovered in a talk that talked about racism in Europe, in Europe, because I was in a number of talks uh, around it, what I discovered is, is that those beads are not from Africa. Most of those beads are made in Venice, Italy. And more specifically, or the most cherished glass beads are made in Murano, which is an island, a smaller island um, off of Venice. And when I trace the information in terms of how far back this bead making um, craft went, I discovered that the Venetians had been making had been making these specific glass beads, and glass beads were used in the mid Atlantic slave trade as currency. So, but what I discovered is is that there was another slave trade that preceded the Atlantic slave trade by eight centuries, which was the Mediterranean slave trade of taking uh, Sub-Saharan and North Africans uh, into present day Iran uh, and India uh, and other parts of the Mediterranean. So Ven this is how Venice <laughs> gets a lot of its capital through its merchant traders who use the trade beads, but also traded a lot in spices. So I thought it was very interesting uh, a very interesting history that we don't know about that often talks about this relationship uh, that uh, Italy has with um, Africa. Let me say this before I move on. Uh, um, in Italy, Italy is very regionalized, meaning um, um, it's there's, there's uh, how do I want to say this? So Italy became a country in the late 1800s. Before it was that, before it was Italy, it was broken into small fiefdoms. Those fiefdoms became regions once it became Italy, but in Italy, they still operate as fiefdoms. So Venice, which is in the Northern part of Italy, uh, is considered the more affluent, the richer part. And Southern Italy, such as Sicily, uh, Calabria are, Consider the poor parts of Italy and are, are, are in a lot of ways considered lowbrow, except when it comes to food, very similar to the United States. So when I began to understand the interaction with, with Africa, I thought it was really interesting that the popular culture, and then there's other things as well, the Moors. So the Moors, let me just say this, the Moors are a very important um, part of, history of Italy for several reasons. Um, so when you go to Italy, there is a small island. It's the last island furthest west. It is closer to Tunisia than it is to actually Sicily. So there has been interaction between North Africa, you know, in, in Italy forever. It's right, it's right there. But sometime in the 700s, the Moors actually begin to occupy, well, they occupy and rule over Sicily for 200 years. However, the influences uh, previously to that occupation and afterwards still resonate not only in Sicily, but also throughout, a, throughout Italy, but it looks uh, very different. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I saw something in the chat, okay. Another thing I wanted to add, I was like I said, I was I was in Florence, Italy, which is Firenze. Um, it's, it's called Firenze in, in Italy. Uh, in Italy. Uh, it was the center, the finance center of the Roman Empire from roughly the fourth to the seventeenth century. And if you understand the the the, the history of Firenze, Moors embedded themselves in the nobility. So even if Moors did not have full and total control over that region, they had embedded and entrenched themselves into, um, into, that, into those areas, which in my opinion, I'm gonna get my notes, which my opinion plays into the current day identity of Italy because the, the joke is, is that 
Italy is the blackest, whitest European country in the EU. Uh, and because of their approximate, their, the, the location to Africa and the relationship with Africa, there is this kind of underlying um, um, understanding that the, the um, miscegenation that went on still resonates today. So Italy is not necessarily fully white. This becomes, um, but what happens is, is that in Italy's history, during the era of Mussolini, when Nazi Germany emerges, this idea of whiteness though, uh, um, emerges uh, very strong in Italy. And today you still see sentiments of this white nationalism that are actually kicking up. When I was there, okay, uh, one of the places that I saw these sentiments of what whiteness is or what whiteness looks like is at the coffee shop. The coffee shop is emblematic of some very interesting things. If you're in Italy, every morning before you go off to work, you stop at your, your local coffee shop. It's like a bar and you have espresso. You're standing up. You talk to the people uh, who, who's the business owners. You talk to the people who come through. You might have a carnetti. You might have, you know, a pastry, uh, and then you go about. Then you go about your business. You go back to the coffee shop during lunch. After lunch, after you eat your meal, you take an espresso. You, you know, you have a talk, and then you go about your business. So I thought it was very interesting that the coffee shop became a site where I was highly cognizant of imagery that, as an American was perceived as racist, hence the blackface character on the top of the coffee shop. Uh, as well, uh, coffee in Italy is also a mark of colonialism because of its relationship with Eritrea and Ethiopia, which it gets a lot of its coffee beans from. So uh, not so the, 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 the daily visits at the coffee shop not only mark uh, a communal ritual, but a communal ritual uh, that establishes identity in whiteness or identity that is anti-Black. And not only was it at the physical locations at the coffee shop, but also uh, on the coffee packages and in the advertisements, these are just some of them. On the bottom left, the, uh, the Michela Italia, the bottom left, that actually is a, um, it's a, it's an advertise, uh, sorry, like a postcard that goes for 20 euros. Um, and even some of the coffee shops that I went to, the, um, the, the coffee mugs, they're not mugs, but the little, the, the small little uh, ex uh, espresso mugs or on the right, they had these, uh, what we would call blackface caricatures on them and they were in the window. Another thing that I saw were the Testa di Moro, right? But in a very different way. The Testa di Moro were in home decor stores and also they were in fashion stores. Um, this is a more wider version of it, but this was the most prevalent image that you saw that we would consider blackface, but it has a dual meaning. The Testa di Moro, um, uh, from what I understand, initially was a um, um, was a was a not necessarily a uh, hmm, how, how do I want to say this? The Testa di Mora, the heads of the Moor, was supposed to be an aesthetic, um, and um, an aesthetic that starts actually in the Dutch region uh, with uh, this home decor uh, that was made. <laughs> in representation of the Moors. However, the narrative was flipped. Instead of the Moors being in places of nobility or in places of power, they were in places of servitude sometimes, uh, or they were presented, and, and these were full body figurines and statues, or they were presented as heads. These heads actually serve as vases where they put plants in them. I asked the store owner, well, what's behind the heads? 
And the heads are coming out of, um, uh, they're made everywhere, but they're most popular and they're coming out of Sicily. The story goes, is what I was told multiple times, is it's a, it's a love story. A, a dark-skinned Moor fell in love with a, a fair-skinned local in Sicily. They have a relationship, but she finds out that he actually is married with children, so she cuts off his head and then plants, uh, puts plants in it uh, as a sign of revenge. So I thought this was really interesting <laughs> that this was not seen as an act of violence, but as an aesthetic. Um, I'm still working through my understandings of the testa di moro, but it is very much connected to, in my opinion, what we see in the United States in terms of uh, presenting and represent, representation of blackness and popular culture. So this is a very, very, very rough assessment that I'm working with and I'm still writing on um, because I'm still fresh from Italy. So I welcome all your comments and conversation and questions. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Of, Shivers, I, I'll jump in just because uh, I want to also address the elephant in the room. There's a lot of Jess Borsmas here. I apologize for that. So I, I'm the real Slim Shady. Um, <laughs> so the, but I, 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 I really appreciate your kind of this, what I would call a cultural ethnography of, of, of your experience, right, in, in Italy and, and, and shared in the chat the resonances that I had, right, of the Conguitos. And, and, you know, the entirety of the, those moros, right? And in Spain, you have a similar uh, issue, right? right. Bet between Italy and also what we call the Maghreb, um, this the, the, the Gibraltar, right, is only, is, is, is less than 10, about 10, 15 mm -hmm. miles, right? Between right. some, some ways, um, you're more connected to Northern Africa and Southern Spain right. than the rest of Europe, right? So, um, you know, kind of thinking about how you, you approach this, you know, you're looking back at this, this long trajectory arc of history, and then you're thinking about the, the immigrant, uh, you know, the Mediterranean has kind of returned again in a certain right. way. Um, how, what is your kind of takeaway, if I may ask, of what does it mean to, to your own positionality, right, as a, as a scholar and a researcher mm -hmm. and a doctor from NYU, from, you know, to, to deal with race and confront racism in, in the cradle of civilization, the Mediterranean? How, 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 what, are, what, are, what are your next steps with when you kind of com were confronted with this, being in Florence and Murano and, 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 and see this? Mm, that's it. I, I'm gonna answer it as best as I can. <laughs> that's oh, a yeah, lot. Sorry, that was a bad. That was no, question. no, no. That's okay. That was a constant question uh, that I asked myself, you know, daily because I was in a position of privilege. Uh, after people realized that I was one American, that was the first thing. One, when I said I was American, that changed the dynamic. Oh my goodness! And then when I said I was a professor, that changed the dynamic. And then I said I was a professor at NYU. NYU has this lovely campus in Florence where even the locals are forbidding to go. So they were like, oh my gosh, you're at Villa La Pietra? So it totally changed the dynamic. It was so different for me there than it is here. So I was acutely aware of the privilege which often clashed with my relationships with the local black folk, right? because I was considered bourgeoisie. So I was often trying to figure out how do I work around it as well. I discovered in the pandemic, I was highly surveillance because like I said, my husband and I were the only black people. We were just blah, 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 buying our water. We didn't know until uh, my husband went back to the United States and the, the, the bake, one of the bakers that I frequented asked and, and, and said, yeah, I haven't seen your husband. I mean, he knew exactly how long he was gone. That was a, a point of, wow, and, and not only him, but also, you know, I would see panhandlers and different people uh, in the area uh, who, who were black. What was going on during that, what was going on during that time, there was a, an acute push by black folks throughout Europe to ban the blackface um, 
um, celebrations that go on in uh, France, Spain, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, and, um, and, and England, in parts of England, right? So this is the, it, during Christmas, uh, sometime around Christmas. Uh, and it's called like uh, Swarta Piet, I think, uh, in the Dutch. And so, um, so this, this, this issue, uh, so global blackness was changing before my eyes while I was there. And uh, in conversation, I thought that the best way to kind of understand it was to have conversations with other local blacks. Uh, one of the negotiations were is that there were few blacks that were considered professional class where I was situated. So our survival or understanding were radically different. You know, I was having conversations with sex workers and homeless folk and uh, Nigerians who were being abused by other Nigerians. And I was, you know, living very, very well. The only thing I did was miss my mother and father. So in the in during that time, I, I, I often thought about it, but uh, it was me more so from the point of view of, 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 of really how do I make sense of um, how do I make sense of my connections and relationships uh, to this as as, as being a, a, an immigrant, but an immigrant with uh, with with a level of privilege. So I'm, as you can see, I'm still working through it. Uh, it was very, very foreign to me. And I, I still try to wrap my head around it. I mean, somebody told me just the fact that you can buy yourself an espresso every day means that you are a person of means. So um, yeah, so I, 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 don't, I don't know if that necessarily answered the question, but as an ethnographer, you, off, you often want to contribute back to the communities in which you study. My work in understanding this um, a, a society that is racist, but also purports a racelessness uh, is something. But I also want to say this, this is really very interesting. In almost every establishment that I went into, I always either heard Motown music or hip hop. It was interesting. I would walk in and I mean, they had the good cuts, okay? The great cuts. And I would walk in and I'm like, hey, you know, but at first they're like, who are you? Why are you here? And when they heard my accent, they're like, oh, you're American, come on. So it was really interesting that African-American music was the backdrop to Italy, but it is, it could be such a hostile climate to brown or blacker people. Yeah, Dr. Shivers, I think that, Kaya, thank you. That was, that was great. I asked you a really loaded question about positionality and intersectionality and, right. and and I'm way out of my league too. I think we've got colleagues for you know Hickman and 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 Bill Alexander and others and, and, and that studied this as a cultural anthropology, but I really, really appreciate that uh that response because it's really complicated to think about all those layers. And and I, to be honest, if you had like said, hey, I got it all figured out, <laughs> I would have been right. like, how did you figure that all out? We we haven't done that for 700 years. So thank you for that that really the authenticity of that response. Oh, no, no, no problem. I also wanted to kind of just say, say, say this as well. When the pandemic happened, the pandemic started in Northern Italy. It started in, and majority of the pandemic was in Milano, was in um, Bologna, was in Veneto. And people who were in Central and Southern Italy were like, aha, that's what you get, you rich people, right? Because it's very regionalized. However, when the world began to look at Italy and say, well, what's wrong with Italy, right? And, and, and then people became this one Italian identity and the flags were flying and people became Italian again. And so this is the work that I do in diaspora or identity. This is that we really live fractured existences, but when crises happen, when we need resources, or there are moments where we band together and we become this glob of something, in order to satisfy whatever that need is at the time. But once that need is fulfilled, we go back to these fractured identities. Dr. Dr. Shivers, I love, love your presentation. I mean, of course, we, I get to talk to you a little more. I was, I, I knew a little bit about your experience. Um, I, I am wondering, um, 
uh, two things. One, I do think that there is a level of non-honesty about Blacks and travel and how Black folk traveling, Black Americans traveling abroad might experience the world a bit differently than their colleagues, particularly as this narrative, this oral narrative of like, well, racism is a really an American problem. It's an American institution um, and not, not really kind of a tentacle of colonialism, right? Um, I am interested both in the narratives of other Black folk who are, who are also um, maybe American that you might have run into or have had this conversation with, who have been living abroad in Europe as kind of privileged or in a professional class, wondering if their spirit experiences mirror you um, and what kind of advice you would give to folk who are traveling abroad, uh, particularly in this moment where African-Americans uh, have been embracing travel uh, to places like Torini and all those, and you know, places in Italy. We were, we had been talking about taking a trip to Italy as well in my, in my family, but now I'm, I gotta think about it a little more because um, France was traumatizing when I went the first time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was not prepared. I just was not prepared to be in the car being told that I was not American. Uh, and I didn't really want to be American, but I didn't know what else I was supposed to be. And so I was, <laughs> I, people assumed I was Nigerian or Jamaican or something else. So, that, uh, so like, it was really interesting to see this conjuring of what America is. This question of minstrelsy that you have raised for us, do, I'm wondering, I mean, the images are striking because they, they look like they're right out of jungle jitters or they look like they're part of kind of this, this, this folly of blackface. I am wondering, if, are those images, do those images have a similar rise um, out of the, of the response of places like Haiti um, and Barbados getting freedoms? Um, so these colonialized spaces that may be asking for freedom or fighting for freedom. And so we see the rise of minstrelsy as a way to create a new kind of white supremacist aesthetic. I'm, I'm wondering, is do they have does do those images simultaneously happen are conjured at the same time as we are taking on minstrelsy is there a parallel so i looked at the time you got me sweating uh mr palmer <laughs> <laughs> i looked at the time the time and there are some overlappings particularly particularly in the caricature i'm working on kind of like this idea or this thesis uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm talking specifically about minstrelsy and then I'll work back uh, in my engagement with other American, black Americans were there uh, I, as I met a, a couple, but not a lot. Uh, so uh, I think that, so in, in African diaspora or black diaspora scholarship, we often talk about this term called the black Atlantic. And the Black Atlantic uh, represents one, the, the middle passage in which black bodies were trans transferred and shipped uh, three, you know, through the three continents of Europe, Africa, and the Americas, um, or four continents in the Caribbean. But also, I don't think we have acutely paid attention to the European or the white Atlantic. And in this, 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 this passage. The idea in the Black Atlantic is, is that cultural ideas were exchanged and it still remains. So, and the idea is, is that even after uh, you know, the age of discovery and slavery, these conversations are still going on between Black Brits and Caribbean folk and people in the United States and people in Africa. Those conversations are still happening with Europeans and white Americans. It's just a little different. I'll explain why. Actually, the, the joke was when I was in Italy, <laughs> my grandmother's grandfather was Sicilian, all right? So I was gonna do a gag and say, I have blood, a line that I want to trace, but it never happened. But anyway, so what I was thinking in understanding European identity, prior to all of Europe becoming France and England and all this, it was very tribal. It was absolutely tribal. So when you, in, you are in America and you're fighting for resources and power, right? You become this white thing, right? This white group. 
Well, what happens when you're from a country where you don't look phenotypically as white as somebody from the northern western part of the UK? Which is what happened to my, whatever that is, grandfather seven something over was upset because when he came to America, they did not accept him as a white man. He was like a, a swarthy, olive colored, you know, European, which pissed him off. He's like, I came all the way over and I can't get this privilege. So in my opinion, this becomes part of the negotiation of what happens with whiteness, which in my opinion is connected to these very extreme representations of what black people look like. Because we all know if you go to Louisiana, Tennessee, places in Virginia, you know, there are people on this call who phenotypically might look white, but we know in our family, we have family members that they identify as black. So I'm so these caricatures are coming up when Italians and Irish are migrating to the United States and they're trying to assert their identity and whiteness. And so you've got to create this imagery that says, hey, I may be a little bit off, you know, than the Dutch, but I'm definitely not this. That's, that's my first answer. The second answer, I think, in terms of my engagement with other Black, Black Americans, one person in particular, his grandfather served in World War II and um, actually married an Italian woman, moved back to Tennessee, became really a part of the desegregation movement in Tennessee. And so then he returns as the grandson back to Italy and marries an Italian woman. So he very much is, <laughs> in some ways, he's very much entrenched in Italian life, but in Italy, he's known as the Black History Month guy. So he actually um, puts on Black History Month throughout Italy, but is with a global perspective uh, of, of what Black history uh, means. Um, the other person that I had conversations with was, was a Black woman who met and married an Italian man and lived, and she worked um, as a yoga instructor. The guy had more positioning uh, um, than the woman, but what was very clear that was something that both of them grappled with uh, is um, uh, other people who identified as Black wanted to be considered Italian first and Black maybe, you know, further third or fourth or fifth. And so there was such a, there was such a, an emphasis to be Italian and to be accepted by mainstream Italian that it clashed with a lot of the experiences of being African-American and attempting to hold on to that Blackness or that African identity while at the same time being American. Travel has always been very difficult for me. In the pandemic, it was e even more difficult, especially crossing the borders. Um, another thing was people were shocked that I was a Black American woman still in Italy because Italy's borders were very rigid. So uh, in France and Germany at these connecting flights, I had to pull out every document but my underwear to show them that, you know, I was in fact who I was. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Shivers for this wonderful presentation. I'm not just Horsma, I'm Hikmet Kojomanar from yes, the yes. Department. <laughs> I so, own your email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, I really enjoyed your talk and I want to piggyback on what you just said about those hyphenated identities, right? Italian, you know, black Italian or African Italian kind of thing. So um, I'm teaching a course right now called Religion and Public Life. And in that course, we are reading a ethnography by an African-American cultural anthropologist, Trika Danielle Keaton, who mm -hmm. did her research among the Muslim schoolgirls who are of African descent, right? So a lot of these migrant girls came to France, actually their family, their parents came to France uh, as they are now second or third generation migrants, right? Um, and as an ethnographer, when she came to France for the first time, a lot of people would say racist things blatantly, right? Because they don't know she's an American. 
Um, and she's treated exactly like these African migrants. However, when she opens her mouth, like you said, and they hear her accent because also like rap music, hip hop, and all these like African-American cultural products are very prominent in France as well. She's immediately treated in a more privileged and in a less discriminatory way. So she talks about that. And another thing she talks about is how basically a lot of these migrants um, cannot claim uh, their identity publicly, right? Because in France, there's that notion that, that once you migrate to France and you are naturalized and you become a citizen, you are French. And the notion of citizenship is predicated on a homogenous identity. They define French society as one and indivisible. Therefore, claiming that you are African Italian or African French or Muslim French actually goes against that idea of national solidarity. So I was wondering if Italy has something like that in, in their understanding of citizenship. Um, so can somebody be you know, of African descent? Uh, are there migrants who are claiming, you know, in cultural products or in their everyday lives, hey, you know, I'm African, I'm Italian. My, I, I have a little comment, this is not a question. When you mentioned all those like cultural heritage, right? It reminded me of Othello by Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. Othello is a Moorish general serving in the Venetian army, fighting the Ottomans um, <laughs> in, in the Cyp Cyprus island, right? Because the Ottomans are about to capture Cyprus. And there are a lot of, you know, racist slurs thrown at Otola as well. Iago insults him using racial slurs. It also reminded me of that, that Italian culture, you know, might have these kind of historical examples of racism against Moors. Right. It's a, you know, wow. These are some really great questions. <laughs> we could, I want to break out an espresso and drink because um, these are things that we really need to talk about. Uh, so... When you were talking about France, the first thing that came up was language, right? So in France, because my mother was a French teacher, my mother actually French, taught French, Latin, and Spanish. Uh, and the first time that she and my father could go to France, it was like during the 25th anniversary, a 30th anniversary. And um, while they were in customs, they mistook my dad. Well, they asked my dad where, where he was from. My father's a very tall, dark man. My father, you know, from Mississippi, and he has a very strong Mississippi accent. He explains where he's from. They were like, okay. So then my mother, they're, 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 you know, stamping her passport. My father walks away. An African man runs up to my dad and starts hugging him and crying. And, and, and speaking in French, my mother interprets for my dad and says, oh, you know, he, you look just like his father. Well, then the customs agents surround my parents and say, well, you told me you were from America. You lied, right? But it was because my mother spoke perfect French that they were okay, right? So in France, this idea of, of having entryway into assimilation through language still is very pervasive. In Italy, it's not necessarily an entryway because I cannot tell you how many times I was speaking to somebody and somebody else came up and they were speaking in Italian, da, 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 you know, uh, and the person left, they were like, and by the way, their Italian is horrible, right? So language is very much emphasized in Italy um, as well. But with this skin and these codes, you still don't have the access or entry into it like you would have in some ways in, the French culture, right? There's more of a, but 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 it start it starts with language, and that is because, in my opinion, the immigration laws are so stringent that it's very hard for you to get status if you cannot locate your bloodline or you are not married uh, to an Italian. And there have been people who've been married to Italians who said that they had a lot of difficulty uh, gaining some. Uh, type of citizenship. So in a lot of ways, it, it, it is very white national, nationalistic in terms of having that entryway and access. But I say Italy is like a, um, in my opinion, I, I wrote this, it's like a dichotomy. It's like a binary. It's a desire, but it's also a disgust. 
it's a specter and a spectacle to be the other, right? So I was in Calabria and, well, let me pull this back. In Palermo, I got the most kind of like out front, a woman tried to kick me out of a restaurant because I asked her to stop bumping into me. It was a waitress. But at the same time, when I would walk down the street and I would have like a, my head wrap on or some linen, they're, oh my goodness, you're so beautiful. Bella, bellissimo, bella, bella, bella. You know what I mean? So it was this, 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 this dichotomy. Nonetheless, part of the issue that was articulated by the group and the activists that are coming out of mostly the southern part of Italy and in Rome is this access to resources and being treated in some ways as if at the bare minimum in, 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 humane. Because you can walk down streets and you're called this or you're sexually harassed. There's all these things that go on that get totally unchecked. I hope that answers it. Yeah, that, thank you. Build the nome. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Um, if I may, I, I, I know a bit about uh, a lot of African American jazz musicians who either you know, uh, emigrated to Europe, um, at least for much of their careers, some permanently, felt that they were much more accepted in Europe um, than they were in the States. Um, but, but I suspect that most of them are focused on France. I was wondering if you could speak to that, if there is, if you saw any, if you looked at this at all, perhaps not, but is there a difference that you perceive between France and Italy and that type of acceptance of American Blacks? So I would say that um, the embrace of American Blacks and particularly like those in a, what we would call like a creative class, which is a bourgeoisie class, you know, music, food, those things are highly respected mm -hmm. uh, because, well, music is highly respected because it's considered an intellectual space. Um, and so uh, that, thus jazz is always, jazz is another thing that, that, that is always played. However, I would say, in my opinion, um, there's this sentiment of the more younger idea is we'll take your music, we'll have your culture, but we don't have to have you. You know what I'm saying? So if that, if that makes sense. And so there have been, um, there were actually, I began to study, there was um, actually a woman who was a nun uh, who moved to Florence and lived out the rest of her life in Florence uh, and found more of a refuge but all of the people that we're talking about are people who are considered bourgeoisie, who are elite. You know, we're not talking about a quote unquote commoner. It's very hard to survive, to survive like, like that. In my opinion, I might be, I might be totally wrong. And, and by the way, um, I, I grew up in a second generation Italian family in the Bronx. And um, some of those images are really familiar to me. And the story of the uh, Testa di Moro really makes us E more easily understand Scorsese movies, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, yeah, grand okay. my grandparents had a, had a set of large lamps in the full body uh, figurines of Moors, a male and a female, holding these ceremonial umbrellas. Mm -hmm. And they were quite beautiful in terms of how they were painted, but clearly this was the image that, that were handed down to us in generations. Those lamps were with us for three or four generations probably. Right. And, and, and um, there was a, so I understand because I actually, I wanted to take some of them home. They're so, some of them are so ornate and so beautiful. And even in Calabria, there were Medusa heads, right? So I understood the, the dichotomy that I talk about this, 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 this desire or this reverence, but at the same time, there's this idea of servitude in some in Venice, most of the castles are decorated with these blackamoors holding lanterns uh, in, um, in the walkways. Uh, at NYU, uh, the reason why I wanted to study blackamoors is because NYU has a museum uh, in, on, the, on its campus of Villa La Pietra and the collectors or Villa La Pietra used to be owned by a woman who was from a Chicago financier family who married a British guy who was an art collector. And he actually collected a lot of Blackamoors. After they died uh, and World War II happened, the Blackamoors and its popularity diminished. And so there's still a lot of those at this 
uh, museum. And a lot of the students were highly uncomfortable with them. So a lot of conversations about them and what they meant uh, really um, ha had to be had and probably still do. Similarly, when I was in Venice, um, several of the merchants, because uh, they sell like these Moorish heads as like brooches and pendants, said that a lot of the African-American <laughs> uh, tourists often would argue with them because those were seen as black faced characters. The problem is, is that Italy don't want to talk about race. When you do not want to talk about race, you're going to come up against this every single time. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Shivers. Sorry. Uh, hi, Dr. Shivers. Um, we actually met once I walked over to Auxiliary Services. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I did come in um, a bit late, unfortunately, so you might have already answered this question, but um, I, I had, and you already sort of touched on this, um, but one of my questions was, so like that coffee shop that you saw, did you like not go to that coffee shop um, out of the principal? Um, and then my second part of that question is, did you try to like explain where you were coming from or do other people try to explain or is there even any point to that? So yeah, so um, I never went to that coffee shop, but I passed that coffee shop almost every day because in Italy, you know, you buy little things of food. So I would always, you know, walk by the coffee shop, very highly popular coffee shop. But one of the coffee shops that I did go in and I didn't, all of their, all of the char characters were actually on the, 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 the plates and in the cups. So I didn't realize it until I got my espresso. Uh, and I got it. I was like, what is this? And I went up to the woman. I was like, what is this? And they were like, oh, this is art. This is beautiful. I'm like, this is not art. Why don't you put like a crazy looking white person on here? Like, I don't understand. And they're like, oh, you Americans, you come here with your racism. And da -da -da -da. And I mean, they just go into these condition fits and they don't want to talk about it. Right. So I, 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 I don't. So I, I stopped going to it. So the go to and this is with some of my colleagues too on Villa La Pietra totally shut down because it's a very difficult it's very difficult for them to talk about it because there is no language for it when you don't have language to talk through and talk about it then you feel like you're being attacked you feel like you always have to be on the defensive side uh, and you feel as if people are like bashing your intellectual capacity and your culture so there was always this like roadblock um, in that as well. Another response I got was, well, Italy never really colonized anybody. Kind of, sort of Ethiopia, maybe a little bit of Eritrea, but it's a very white country. And so that's why I said Italy is the blackest, whitest country in the EU, right? I'm like, y'all bugging, first of all, right? So it's this like trying to step around, you know, identity and you know th th their blackness even though i forgot the city but there is like a huge statue of moors it's called the four moors and they're all in chains it's it's a bondage scene uh so um that's what the black activists in some ways are pushing against but a lot of it is they want entryway into the main in the status quo so we'll see how that looks but there's some movement on the ground Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go into here. And I think Dominican Republic is racist classes like that. Oh, OK, black citizens have the national race for their nationality. Not surprised, especially with the, um, the massacre that happened against uh, darker black skinned people in order to purify the race uh, uh, in, the, in the DR. Um, okay. I was so shocked about the Moor history. Oh yeah, there's a lot of history that people are still uncovering about the Moors. You know, in Italy is mountainous and there were a lot of earthquakes and you had volcano eruptions. So a lot of these old civilizations actually plummeted or were, were heavily destroyed. So architecture and archeologists are still continuously digging up stuff. Let me tell, let me drop this, the four more statue information. There is a town, it's a historical, it's a UNESCO heritage site. It's called um, 
Matera, Matera, M-A-T-E-R-A. Matera, which is located on the east, southern east side of Italy, has the oldest documented um, uh, continuous civilization in all of Europe. And when I went down there and there, they were talking about what the old culture was and what who, who was considered their Christ, it was a black man. <laughs> I was laughing. I said, y'all black, y'all need to stop it. Come out the closet. Come on, family. But um, yeah, so it's a really kind of interesting dynamic. And then also when I was, I know these are kind of like side notes, but when I was in nor the Northern part um, of Italy, uh, there was always this emphasis saying that, oh, those poor Southern Italians were the ones who migrated over to the United States. We, we, we went over there like the 16, 70, 100, we came back. It wasn't for us, but all those poor ignorant ones, those are the ones you got. And if you go down to Southern Italy, you'll see what I mean, because they don't even know how to speak good Italian. They actually don't speak Italian. We don't know what it is that they speak. And I said, wow, this is so interesting because it's very similar to what happens in the United States with the North and the South. Everybody want to, you know, dog the South out, but they come there for the food. They come there for the moonshot, you know, all those things, which I love. So, and they talk about how, how you know, in minstrel, minstrelsy is based in uh, making fun of Southern dialect, Black dialect, right? So this is really interesting. This is very interesting. <laughs> Sean is laughing. So I know that was a roundabout question. I don't know. Uh, Director Palmer, where should we go right now? <laughs> well, I mean, you've put a lot on the table for us to think about because I don't think that I don't think that we have had d a, a deep discussions about what racisms look like in terms of both travel experiences. And it looks like Shanita has her hand up, which yeah. is one of our students. So let's privilege one of our students to, to open her mouth and say something to us. Come on, Shanita. Good evening, Dr. Shepard. Good evening, Sean Palmer evening. and everyone else on the call. I did come late now. I, I, I'm so upset that I did, but I was um, doing work. But I had a question for you. Hopefully I didn't miss you answering this. But um, my question is, as far as activism in Italy and the time that you spent there, were there any grassroots organizations that you noticed that were actively combating or um, trying to invoke the conversation about the Black presence in Italy and the racism that they're subjected to? Because um, I would be curious to try to follow up on some of those and see what they're doing. Because I, I, I heard when you said that the language isn't there which is why it was so problematic because the conversations aren't being had. Um, but I was still curious to know if, if any um, Black organizations existed to where they were actually trying to put the language into the media to talk about racism that they experienced. So that's, a, that's an excellent question. I just found out today because I, I was talking to some of my folks and my sources just to make sure factually I got some things uh, correct. As I understand it, the activist space is highly connected to the nonprofit space, which is connected to the mafia. <laughs> and that the, the, how the nonprofit organizations work, there's about five major ones and there are ancillary ones after that, but you've got to go through these certain channels to get approved. There have been black activists who have attempted to either start organizations or groups or collectives that, that uh, advocate uh, African people. Um, there's actually like a huge Dominican Republic uh, migration too as well, and Brazilian and, and Panamanian uh, in, in Italy. Uh, but a lot of these organizations have gotten shut down because these nonprofits feel like they're racist because they're hyper-focusing on Black experience and Black empowerment. So there is a lot, a lot of the organizations are loosely organized or they're quote unquote off the books, which makes it hard to remain organized because you can't officially bring in money, right? 
So that's one of the issues. Another thing that I discovered is, is that a lot of these organizations <clears throat> are much like the hierarchies or the intellectual hierarchies uh, in Italy, where people value those in positions that are considered a power or high intellectual status. So a lot of these organizations are not ran by people on the ground, not ran by people in the projects or you know, undocumented workers, a lot of them are professors or, you know, highly acclaimed artists. And I've talked to and been in some of these spaces and have a lot of disagreement with, with this, this idea, um, you know, and I tried to explain this idea, well, at least you could be talented Tim. If you're a small percentage of the population, advocate for all, but it's more so this Black re respectability understanding of I have the pedigree, I should have access just like everybody else. I don't know about those other people, but I know I should have access. So, but I'm not saying that's all the organizations. Those are the ones that I engaged with. There are people who have a difference of opinion, but an organized collective, I did not see it as such. Awesome question, awesome question. I know it's 709 and I know that we've given you an hour, maybe we've made you hungry and you're thinking about your Italian pastas or your Sicilian <laughs> shrimps. Oh, I had to leave that pasta alone, even though I had pizza today, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> you might be thinking about Ooh. all of that and the hands that, that feed you, um, but we are so thankful um, for the time, which is ours. Um, and we wanna say, we hope that this conversation has been enlightening. Yes, we can send it out. Um, Dr. Okay. Shivers will be, she has, two more conversations uh, out loud. Um, mm -hmm. And then she's gonna do a third com a third conversation at uh, the Association for Black Cultural Centers mm -hmm. Conference in conversation wow. with Angel Garcia. Um, and they'll be talking about African derived religious traditions in the new world, um, particularly around Santeria and uh, Yoruba, Yoruba traditional religions. So they'll be talking about some of those, uh, some of those things. Um, the next conversation, Kaia also has a cohort of students. I think there are probably 30 students in her cohort. We are calling it the Kaia cohort. So you'll see students uh, meandering around and, and conversing with her. She will be visiting some classes. So her schedule is real tight, y'all. But we hope that you will come and hear her. She's in the office regularly. Um, and as we open the doors of the center, we pray that she will, um, she will continue to be a, a resource to you until um, she has to return to her beloved place. So we thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Kaya, you do get the last word, Dr. Shivers, because the sisters have the floor. <laughs> so let me just say this. Italy was one of the most transform transformative experiences that I had in my life. Uh, let, let me emphasize that. I met some wonderful people there and I learned a lot um, about this mythic culture that was mythic, you know, for me. Uh, and it helped me understand, you know, in the United States, you often talk about race and blackness, and then you're like, let's talk about whiteness and everything. But going there, going to Europe and, and, and living it and seeing it and, and, and understanding that it is much more complicated and much more textured and nuanced and layered than I ever imagined. Um, to me, it makes me urge those of you who are coming up after us, older heads, not old, older heads, to continue these conversations across the globe. Um, because, um, you know, I engaged with a lot of European students my last year there, and there was such a hunger to understand this world and change this world. Uh, so I just leave on that. Um, I forgot to talk about religion. Now that you said that, you know, I don't know why I missed that one, but I do thank you all for staying the whole time. I believe I left my email, but I'm going to put my email in the chat just for those of you who did not get it. And I, I welcome coffee chat for those who are grown, Vino, um, and Moonjai. Thank you. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Gracias mille. Gracias mille. <laughs>